Well, beloved, it's my joy for us to be in the Word of God one more time. I miss you, and I pray that you are doing well. Last Sunday, we opened up worship for the first time in six weeks. And I fully understand those who chose to stay home and those who had to stay home. But understand, we had a most wonderful, wonderful outpouring of God's grace. Uh, it was a sweet group, nearly 70 folks. The joy and the happiness of the Lord and the love of Christ was just in abundance. So as the weeks unfold, I hope that more and more of you will, will be able to attend. In the meantime, we will continue uh, recording the Wednesday night worships and doing Sunday school uh, on Zoom and those other areas as we um, have our flock scattered. I want to thank you for your faithfulness during these strange days. None of us have walked through something like this before, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that the horrors that were spoken of have not materialized. Any suffering and any death is too much. But yet, the truth is that it's appointed unto all men once to die and then the judgment. There's been a lot more folks who have died during this time than those who had the virus. So our compassion needs to go out to all who have suffered loss. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this time that we can get into your word. I ask you that the Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word. Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray for those uh, who are struggling. Father, that you would magnify yourself in their presence. Use us, O oh God. Use believers to be a light and a source of hope in a dark day. Thank you for your blessings on Midway Baptist Church. I thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of our people. Lord, who have been so faithful in, in prayer and in giving. As we move forward, show yourself strong, O oh God. Use us to your glory. Bless our lives by your word tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7, and we're going to be entering into a journey with Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite. Now, last Sunday, we preached on the transfiguration. Moses and Elijah, and Elijah, Elisha, Liza is my granddaughter, Elijah is the prophet. And, and they appeared with Jesus at his transfiguration and spoke about his coming death and resurrection. And so I want us to take a look at this mighty prophet of all prophets. And let's see what we can learn. In verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab. Now Ahab was a very godless and guilty uh, king of Israel at the time. And he told this king, now Elijah shows up on the stage, never saw him before. Boom, here he is. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be any dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, he'd be a lunatic unless the fact that God had really spoken to him to pass that message. Verse 2, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Sherith, which flows into the Jordan. And I will be there, and, I, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So Elijah went and did according to the word of God. For he went and stayed by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan. 
The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. We'll look at that part next week. But I want you to hear me, and hear me really, really clearly. The lesson that I'm going to share from this text tonight, I believe, is one that is crucial and vital to believers in a very special way is the lesson from the drying brook. So who's Elijah? Shows up. Let's get the context right. He shows up. Israel is in a godless state. They have a godless king, a horribly evil queen, Jezebel, and their hearts are cold to the things of God and the prophets of God are being punished. And Elijah shows up and tells them, boldly open to the king. You know the king wasn't alone. And he declares to him the message that God has given him. Then he leaves. Now, such a bold man, such a, a courageous spirit, the next thing God asks him to do is incredibly baffling. God tells him, now here's what you're going to do. You're going to go hide yourself on an obscure brook, the brook Kidrath, and you're going to stay there. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to sit yourself there alone, and the ravens, a declared unclean bird in the Old Testament, is going to bring you your food in the daytime and in the evening. That's what's going to happen. Your job is to be there. The word there is the key word to this entire text. There represents being in the purpose, in the power, and in the provisions of God. It's in being where God has me to be. He didn't tell, he didn't tell Elijah... Just roam around how you want. Find your best you. He didn't do that. Beloved, when we're born again, the Bible says that we are bought with a price. Our very bodies are not our own. We're to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit of God. We're not all sent to the same task in this world. And, but yet, on the other side, we all have the same task, and that's to bring God glory in whatever God has called us to do. And I want us to look at this, at this strange passage of Scripture. For some, you've read this many times, and it's lost its uniqueness. Nobody ever would have thought the ravens would have come and been sent by God to feed this prophet. He never would have wanted to touch a raven. So watch what happens. Because I don't want to... You ever, you ever window shopped? When Beck and I were, were younger, married at 19, Beck took a wonderful joy about just walking through the mall and looking at stuff. She didn't have a covetous heart. That was good because we didn't have any money. But she would look and enjoy and do. And I... And that baffled me, because if I couldn't have it, I didn't want to see it. But it brought her joy. But you know what worries me? That there is a lot of Christians, many Christians, who are satisfied with window shopping by the great promises of God. About God's power and God's promise to provide for us. And they stand looking at the promises, but they never, ever embrace them. They acknowledge them, but they never appropriate them because we never stay there. We don't know what it's like to reconcile 
with people because we never stay there. I got offended. I'm going to the other church. You know what you're going to happen at the other church? You're going to get offended. Being able to stay there until God tells you to go somewhere else is where we find the purpose and the power and the provisions of Almighty God. So if we can, in the moment that we have, Brother Braylon, what time did we start? Did you pay attention to that? No, just, just yell it out. 45. 45. Okay. All right. So I need to hustle. So we come. That only means I've got three hours left of filming time. So here's, here's what happens. I want us to look at this text. And we need to keep asking ourselves the question. Would I have stayed there? If I was in Elijah's position, what would I do there? Better yet, during this time of struggle, you've been there locked up in your home. What you've been doing? That's been your assigned there. What has been happening? Have you grown closer to God? Has the power of God been shown? Have you recognized it? Have we given him the glory for it? This country is just starting to whine and complain about, about the government, what they should have done, couldn't have done. I just want to believe that God answered prayer and people didn't die by the millions. That's what I'm going to do. Man is fallible, but he also is a whining baby. And it just needs... The quicker it stops, the better it is. Can I get an amen from the camera? Amen. It's just vital. So here's what we do. I want us to look at three things that God was creating in the life of Elijah. Learning of how to, to trust God in the midst of experiences. Because look, you know where this is leading. He's going to go from the, from the, from the brook... Then he's going to go be sent by God to the widow's home. And then he's going to go to Mount Carmel and deal with the evil and call fire down from heaven and God's going to answer. But I will tell you, none of that would have happened if he didn't obey in this first step. The big step was not going stand up to Ahab, but to obey God when nobody's looking. You're going to go and you're going to be by this brook. Now, what was that? What was it all about? First of all, I want us, to, want us to know that there, by God's leading, there is the place of God's purpose. God knows what He's doing. I think sometimes we spend way too much time trying to pray out of being there in that situation than trying to find God's purpose for allowing us to be there. Everything that comes, God has a purpose, either to correct us or to strengthen us, but one way or the other. Woodrow Wilson said this, Beware wasting your life on secondary successes. You can spend, we can spend our lives, we can, as a church even, the easy way, the convenient way, the comfortable way. Don't take any big challenges. Don't take any big steps. We just kind of find this nice place. It's kind of like, it's kind of like flying on a plane. It works great for a plane, but it really is a disaster in life. You know what I mean? I want it to board on time. It's like a worship service, the dream worship service, right? It starts on time. You got a comfortable seat. The people around you don't stink. You ever been stuck on a flight where the person by you reeked? That's rough. We take off, smooth takeoff, nice view from the top, easy landing, right on time. That's great. That's what we want in a plane. But that's not God's plan for our lives. God took Elijah and he tested him in the place that was the biggest challenge to a prophet. Everybody's going to think you're scared and you're hiding. 
but you're not. You're getting alone with God so God can teach you some lessons to make you strong in places where you don't realize that you need the strength so that we can be what God will call us upon to be when the time comes. So God sends him and he goes and he's there simply by the will of God. It's hard. You know, the word hide there is translated literally elsewhere, absent one's self. He wasn't there to be out of the sight of people, though that happened. It was so that he can get outside of himself and see himself being alone with God. That's always the greatness of the purpose of God. It's always been that way. You know, God told Jacob in Genesis 35, 1, he says, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there. Jacob, God was going to change him and use him. And he told them, I want you to go to Bethel. Bethel in the Old Testament is the place of worship. He said, I want you to go and I want you to be there. Dwell there. We need to... We're not really ready to move on until we embrace where we are. It doesn't mean that I like it. It doesn't mean that it's not hard. But there's some lessons that this country needed to learn and Christians needed to return to in facing this hard time. And there's times coming up that we need to face. We need to understand by the sovereignty of God, He's put us there. But not only that, Elijah needed to learn that there was the place of God's purpose. God had something for him, not just for somebody else. But number two, that there was the place of God's power. Elijah was going to learn it wasn't in his courage, but in the power of God that his strength would find the courage to go on. Simply there is the place of power. He said, I want you to go there. I'm going to send the ravens to you there. I've empowered them to meet you there. I think it's so important for us, regardless of the moments, because a lot of us are living in our theirs, place of challenge, place of God wanting to grow us in Christ-likeness. And you know, and one of the sad things is we don't stay there focused long enough to understand the power of God in that moment. And so we rob Him of the praise. You remember the little boy? Okay, let me give you an example. Remember the little boy who, who went and um, to hear Jesus? The multitudes were there. And Jesus looked at his disciples, his apostles, and he said, uh, let's feed these folks. And they went, how in the world are we going to do this? There's not enough food. There's, we can't even buy enough. There's not enough money. They, where, the McDonald's is closed. And then a little boy showed up with a few little sardine fish and a couple of biscuits. I wonder when his mama packed that for him that morning if she dreamed what God's power was going to do with that little boy being there and being willing to be there. They brought him and they brought his food and, and they said, this is what we've got. But it sure ain't much. God never asks us to give what we don't have. What God has provided, we're to trust. That's hard. That little boy, you know, one of the things we forget is he could have gone hungry. He could have gone hungry. He could have said, you know what? These other guys, they didn't pay no attention, but I got my little bit. He could have hoarded the toilet paper. 
Saw a lot of that. Never saw that coming. Never saw that coming. Although covetousness is in the Ten Commandments, so that means it's not rare. But the little boy discovered that there is not just the place of God's purpose, but there is the place of God's power. Everyone was, being a, was able to witness what God could do with those who placed themselves in his hands. Elijah, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? I just want you to go sit by the brook. And I want you to let something you never would have thought of, I want you to let the raven come and bring you food. Now, I've heard some preachers say, you know, a raven eats all kind of bad stuff, and so he sent that to Elijah. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that at all. I think it goes right along the lines of, man, you know what? If you trust God and you stay there, you're going to suffer for it, pal. You'll get a reward in heaven, but life's going to stink here. Man, God's never going to give you give you what, what your heart desire is. You ever hear people talk like that? I have. I've heard it a lot in a lot of different ways. The truth is, when I allow my, align my heart with His, and I'm there, I'm satisfied. I find the provision, the purpose of God, the power of God. But here's the last part. There's the place of God's provision. I don't believe God, if, Mo, if Moses, if Elijah had gone somewhere else, I don't believe the ravens would have tracked him down. God's provisions follow God's purpose, and God's purpose is the conduit to God's power. Do you understand? When I'm in God's purpose, and God has a sovereign will for all of us, when I come and I recognize him, if it's not illegal, immoral, or fattening, Lord, I'm there. And I'll be there until you tell me to leave. A lot of people quit their marriages before God ever said anything. And we learn to suffer for it. To be there. Because when we're there, we find God's power to be able to stay there. Not hop up and run. Boy, this pandemic, this, this, I don't even want to call, I, I don't know what to call this, but I can tell you the media grieves my soul. They're invest, so many of them are invested with doom, the model of doom. That's not who my God is. And then when we find God's power, and we're resting in it, we find God's provisions. Now, here's where I go. You ready? Okay, a little bit more. God told him, you're going to sit there and the ravens will feed you. I'm surprised, but then I begin to glorify God because the ravens are doing just what God said. But then the brook starts to dry up. God never told him the brook would dry up. Now, he said, he told Elijah, it's not going to rain until I tell you for it to rain, and you're going to tell Ahab it's going to rain. It wound up being three and a half years, if I remember correctly. How many of us think, listen to me, Elijah was where God told him to be, doing what God told him to do. Who expected the brook to dry up? Wait a minute. That looks like a punishment, Brother Dennis. Elijah's doing what God told him to do, and look what happens. Look what begins to happen. The brook is drying up. I wonder what went through Elijah's mind. 
okay, well, the water was bubbling, now it's slowing down, now it's in pools, now it's turning muddy. Lord, is something wrong? God, did I get out of your will? Lord, why are you doing this? Those are all actions that are really common for us to take. You see, maybe, you ready? Maybe the great test was for Elijah to look and to be able to see who and what he really trusted. Was his trust in a brook filled with water? Or was it in his God? Which one would it be? See, it's so easy for us, myself included, to, to trust God and to praise God and have confidence and to sleep well when the brook is running full of clear water. But you let me start to sit by a drying brook and the test really starts. Am I in? What is God's purpose? Where's God's power? I thought God would provide. Well, the truth is, He always is. But His path is mysterious. So as we go through this, my, my number one challenge is just to trust Him, to be there. To be faithful in the things that God has told me to be. I need to be faithful. Because every one of us one day is going to sit by a drying brook. Where we see our finances get less. Where we see our health diminish. Where we see our loved ones in number dwindle. Will I still be able to say my God is faithful? That's where the testimonies are. And when the time came, God told Elijah, I want you to go to a widow woman. I want you to go there. There was a new there, same God. And Elijah walked away having grown and understanding the purpose of God the power of God in his own life, and how God meets the needs in his own life. And that's what we need to learn as we go through this time together, individually and as a church family. Because then we will see the greatness of the Lord, and we will give a testimony to all who hear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Help us to be there. Help us to stay there. Help us, O oh Lord, to obey your word where it speaks. To keep us steady. To make us prayerful of our concerns but also filled with praise because of your promises and your faithfulness. And grant us grace, O Lord. For in different ways and different degrees, we sit by drying brooks. But Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him drink of me, who gives the water of life liberally. So, Lord, help us to get our eyes off the brook and onto you. And let us drink deeply of your presence and the work of your Spirit is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.